be crystallized and we can spend like four chapters on different types of conflicts. So that's why we're spending time at the beginning of the course putting together each component of the uh, lawyer-client relationship. Uh, we've been talking about lawyer liability just to give you a sense of what these rules try to regulate and what happens when the lawyer violates those rules. So we finish that up. And then we're going to get into a discussion about Rule 1.6, one of the most important rules in professional responsibility, uh, confidences. You know, this, this is a sort of bright line rule. We want to protect confidences of our client. We don't want to divulge everything. We don't want to undermine uh, the essential trust that we have between attorney-client. Uh, and when that occurs, you are not going to be as effective as a lawyer uh, if your client doesn't trust you. So we protect confidences. Now, the tension will be that the general public will not understand that duty that we have, that utmost duty. And you'll see when we talk about Rule 1.6, there are several different uh, exceptions to that rule, but those exceptions are permissive. You'll see the word may. The lawyer may uh, reveal this information. And when anything in the rule says may and it's permissive, and you, if you don't do it, you can't be held liable because you exercise your personal discretion. So there are going to be some cases that we'll talk about later on that will uh, really tug at your heartstrings, really make you think, well, I need to do the right thing, doing the right thing, in quotation marks, will be disclosing. But under the rule, you cannot disclose. And so we're going to have to make some assessments there. Now, we'll know, and we'll do a case later on under Rule 1.2 that says a lawyer cannot assist with the furtherance of uh, criminal activity abroad, cannot allow our services to be used in that particular way. When we find out we have to remedy or mitigate, uh, withdrawing or disavowing may not be enough. We may need to do more public disclosure. So we'll see that throughout the court. Uh, but we're going to see that 1.6 is almost an inflexible rule. We have to keep these confidences uh, to make sure that the attorney-client relationship works well. But before we do that, we're going to finish up lawyer liability. Now, chapter two, lawyer liability, we're really going to look at a number of different things. One is the ethical duty to report misconduct. So we talked about that. We talked about the duties of supervisory lawyers. And keep in mind, I've been emphasizing this over and over again, that just because you are being supervised by someone, you can't say, oh, she told me to do it, therefore it's okay. As a subordinate lawyer, you will have responsibilities as well. And that's under 5.2. You're bound by the rules of professional conduct, notwithstanding that the lawyer acted on the direction of another person. So a junior associate can't say, uh, the senior partner told me it was okay. Now, there may be some room where you can say that this is a reasonable resolution of a, a question, and you exercise your professional judgment. But when we get to the little hearing, which is what we left off in the last class, we're going to look at that. Is, is this a reasonable resolution of a really difficult situation? So much so that the associate can follow the senior attorney's direction, not be uh, worried about violating the professional rules, and not being engaged in any misconduct. So we looked at duties to supervisory lawyers, we looked at the basis of civil liberty, uh, civil liability and legal malpractice, and then we looked at uh, criminal liability. Uh, then we looked at lawyer discipline, a variety of things that can happen, and we'll see these in the cases throughout. Disbarment, suspension, reprimand, or other sanctions, we talked about that. Uh, and then we talked about, on page 65, this notion that we have to protect the public, uh, but there are numerous instances that we saw in chapter where, uh, because this is a self-regulated profession, the way that we protect the public can be seen as uh, somewhat inconsistent because some of the sanctions that we saw were very uh, light. Uh, but that does not mean that you do not comply with the rules. If this is truly a self-regulatory profession, uh, compliance with the rules is a must, and peer pressure so drives that. You see that on page uh, 65. Then we talked about uh, getting the definition of fraud, you see on page 67. If you have some doubts about uh, your client's contemplated conduct or past conduct, uh, the best rule of thumb is not to assist. Fraud is a purposeful deception. You see that on page 67. Then we use some examples. We use uh, the dying uh, mother on page 68. Now that was a good example of the fraud scenario, just your services being used to perpetuate fraud, as well as the uh, supervisory lawyer scenario as well. So we had a number of different rules uh, in that particular case. 1.2b, we said you cannot assist client fraud. Uh, 5.3, you cannot direct non-lawyers to engage in fraud and say, oh, they're not lawyers, they, they aren't impacted by the rule. You would be certifying that fraudulent will at the direction of the attorney, and the attorney is responsible for that conduct. And then also 8.4, a general misconduct, where you violate the rules of professional conduct, and you normally commit a fraudulent act or a criminal act. We noted in that case that the attorney was disbarred in Maryland and suspended for two and a half years in Virginia. You know, and he made all the humanistic arguments. Everything he said was true. I felt sorry for them. Uh, everyone told me it would be okay. This is just one little favor. Uh, this is my client. I'm not really assisting or engaging in brother conduct because this is what she intended. But as I said before, whenever money is involved, things go funny. So you have one of the brothers moving into the house saying, I want this house, uh, and then it unravels from there. So that's kind of you should uh, never be involved in. You will be signing this uh, and witnessing it, and this is a forgery. From there, we talked about a number of different things. We looked at on page 76, uh, rule 8.3, professional duty to report misconduct. And so there's a mandatory duty to report, if you look at 8.3, but the rule recognizes, and this, is, this doesn't diminish the significance of the rule, but uh, the rule recognizes that you can't report everything. I mean, it's just like crime, you can't report every crime. So we want something that is substantial. If you look at comment 3 to rule 8.3, and this is sort of pointed out in, in your chart, uh, it says this, if a lawyer were obliged to report every violation, the failure to report any violation would be an example of a professional offense. Such a requirement would be unenforceable. So we're limiting the reporting obligation to things that raise a substantial question as to the lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness. And the attorney has to know about that. So notice that it's mandatory, but it has this discretionary component into it, in, in it as well, because you have to make a critical assessment about whether or not this raises a substantial question to the lawyer's uh, trustworthiness or fitness to practice law. Then we get exculpatory evidence on page 79. Court again found a violation of 8.3, failure to report this misconduct, and general misconduct as well, uh, and there was a, a public reprimand. There was a duty. Prosecutors don't only prosecute their ministers of justice, and what they are trying to do is uncover the truth, whatever that is. And if you have exculpatory evidence, it should be turned over to the defense counsel. Public reprimand in that case, but some other justices in the uh, Supreme Court in that case said that the, that, the, uh, that the penalty should have been even harsher. And that brings us over to, I think we set up the little, the little hearing, right? Page 86, the little hearing. So, I want you to place yourself in this position, because this very well can happen, not to scare you anything, but this can happen. You, when you start practicing, you're going to get all varying levels of supervision. You'll get uh, lawyers, lawyers, who will, will take you through uh, what you're supposed to do, give you models, mark up your work, give you feedback. That's the best of all possible work. Then there's somewhere in the middle where you're checking in every now and then, and then there's you're on your own. So, this is an extreme example of you are on your own. And so, 
we talk about rules all the time, but there's a lot of things going on in this little hearing on page 86. One is this basic value of uh, competence. Lawyer well, has to be competent. That's the first rule. So you notice the tension of that, that rule. How do you uh, become competent if you've never done it before? You have to do it sometime. Then you have to do it over and over again until you get good at it, and then you're confident. Uh, but also, we don't want you to engage in malpractice in order to get experience. So there's this competence question. There's the question of diligence in this, uh, in this scenario. It's not, it's not just working hard, you're working with a particular objective. So for example, uh, it would be unethical for a law firm to say, uh, just give the associate a, a research problem and say, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, just re you can research it for three months if you want to. I don't have any guidance for you. Just research it and, and then maybe you'll uh, wander your way into the problem, into the solution, and we will uh, build a plan for it. Uh, that would be disastrous. Wasting money, wasting time, unfocused, no one is on top of the matter. Junior associate isn't getting uh, any supervision. Same thing, public interest, that could happen. Uh, so there's this level of competence, this level of diligence, doing all the work that is necessary in order to advance the client's interest. And there's also uh, communication. We have to forget that, but that is one of the major uh, components of the lawyer-client relationship, communication. And so here we are, we are junior associates in this uh, one-man operation, practicing immigration law, and we're in an area that we've never been practicing in before, and we see this attorney engaging in the practice of law, clearly incompetent, and I guess the question is, do we report it? Should we quit? It's really too soon to quit, I guess. What about the money? What about our reputation? What about our student loans that we have to pay back? All those things are, are coming in. We've had a horrible time uh, at this first hearing, you see on page 87, lack of an interpreter, we muddle through, we sort of get the facts, not good. Come back to the office and the uh, secretary assistant says, uh, you're gonna be in for this uh, again, you're gonna go out again tomorrow and do the same thing. 1,500 after cases, and the rationale is, well, it's a high volume clientele, it would not get this any uh, representation unless I did it this way. Don't have time to spend uh, three to four hours on every case. This looks like an assembly line, but they're getting some version of representation and justice, uh, so this is fine. So what about that, how would you resolve this? I guess it says, uh, what advice on page 88? What advice will we give to Pat? Show up and do a bad job at two more hearings tomorrow? Quit? Or is there anything else that Pat must do? They're sort of asking that question to say, does she have to appoint or uh, report this attorney? So what would you do if you were in this situation? Yes? Would have to be the for that's interesting. So how would you do that? You want to be careful, because this is a, that's good what you said, because it sort of sets up confidence. Now, you represent some people, somebody, a client, and you want to ask the season attorney for uh, advice. How would you go about doing that? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that happens. That happens. Then, you know, that gives you deniability too. It just says not, not that you'd be doing anything wrong, but you check with someone who has some insight on this. You post it as a hypothetical, and you got a general uh, answer to your question. Uh, but let's say this is time pressure, though. I think that's a reasonable approach. But uh, it's ten forty-five, and the hearing is at eleven thirty. We have to go down. Down. We've been thinking about this all night. So what do we do? We got forty minutes. To this problem. What, what should we do? And it's too early to quit. We need to get a couple of paychecks under our belt. It's our first time out. So what? What do you do? What about just staying on the job and uh, you know maybe we do this 50 or 60 times and by the 61st time, I'm good, I'm doing it all. I'm doing a lot better. And then uh, those clients after the 61st client, uh, they will be getting the best representation they can. Yeah, go ahead. But you still have time for it. Look it up. But you still have time for it. It's like 60 cases after you get that point. You work hard when you represent those 60 cases. That's true. So, you so what do you do? Do you report yourself and then the guy you're working for? Or? This is making me nervous. These problems make me nervous. Because they're important now. Because I'm hearing that he's trying to get me to go with everything. I'm in very, very critical like, interviews and I don't have the chance to do that, but he's still like, sending to me anyway. Yeah, so what would you do? Fortnite. Okay, so are, are there any consequences? Let's say you've been on the job like a week or two. Do you, do you report then? If this happens, you may not have a choice. Yeah, it's a fact. So, because this is, if, he, if he's willing to spend any experience, then if those are going to be critical interviews, that person whether they stay in the country or not, mm -hmm. that's a person that's not confident. Mm -hmm. So, especially for that's a situation where I don't think you have any choice. Okay, so what if I said these problems are complex, there's so many of them, they are getting some representation, uh, and there haven't been any bar complaints uh, against this guy. Everybody knows he does it this way. It's kind of sloppy, but there's not that many other people doing it, so it competence is relative. No, no, it doesn't matter if he's covered this last week. It doesn't matter whether he's supposed to make it for tomorrow or not. You still have to do these problems with special conduct. So that's your competence. It doesn't matter if it's going or not. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. What about economics? I mean, this, what, could I say this instead of reporting? Uh, we're talking about 1,500 cases. I mean, they, the public defender has the, the similar situation even though it's a government entity. Uh, everyone knows across the country public defenders are overburdened. Uh, you know, 250 to 300 cases uh, for a public defender. You can't do what you need to do on all of those cases. And on some areas of the law, we say, well, they're getting some level of representation. And we know we have this lofty goal of competence, but it's a practical reality of competence. And so there it is. And so the same argument here. Uh, some representation is better than no representation. And maybe this is a reasonable resolution of an arguable question uh, of professional duty. In other words, so long as we're not harming anyone, they may not get the upper level sterling representation, but they're, they're getting, you know, copper or pennies worth of representation. So that's okay. What about that? Yeah. That's not the representation. I promise that. At least with yeah. the public defender's office, there's already, you know, they have, like, they could be intimate. And at least with them, there's still some sort of preference in how you have, like, for junior associates with the public defender, they, they might get, like, senior cases. They're not finding out what they're going to do. I mean, they still have confidence for it. But okay. in this situation, this immigration office itself is totally complex. And you can't just throw in a junior associate office in the event with something as critical as, like, a potential people. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Could it be that maybe she actually did a better job than she thought she was a lawyer and oh. is, like, Trying to like, do a really good job, and this person is in her head. She has an understanding of the reality of 
but the practice is supposed to know that what you're doing, even though it's not the best, maybe it's still within the realm of the competency. You see it to the like, lower end of it? She did something, she didn't hurt anybody, no one's the wise, and we move on and they got some representation. Uh, Ms. Harper would probably say, no, that's not what we promised her, that's not what competence is, it's, it's a sliding scale. Uh, what would you do? Would you report or just keep plugging along and things will get better? Uh, I probably would not report. I guess. It's, it's a, yeah. These problems I need nervous as well. So yeah. <laughs> so what do you think happened in real life? This is interesting. You think she report? She didn't stay around a long time, she quit, found another job. Uh, and it was interesting, there's a personal story to this as well. She was married at the time, they got a divorce after this, but uh, her uh, partner was telling her, uh, sort of what you're saying, that maybe you've been too hard, we need this money, we need two income, uh, that's the way the crisis of, of law is, trial by fire, uh, but she kept feeling uh, that she wasn't giving confident, uh, confident representation. So the student never did report the misconduct, and she uh, just quit about another job. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, Ms. Moore was saying, uh, reach out to someone and talk to them. This is exactly what the student did. So this is an actual case where the student reached out, called Professor Lerman, and, and Professor Lerman knew about this. Now, do you think Professor Lerman reported this to the bar after the student told her? Still, probably use a hypothetical, but you think that, that the professor reported it? Did the professor report it? Ms. Harper, do you think she reported it? Um, just, if she was able to figure out like, who the actual person did. See, that's, that's just it, figuring it out. This, the reason I asked this is sort of a little setup to, to confidence. So, do you think she reported it? <laughs> yeah. She didn't. She didn't. She, she thought that she learned this in confidence. It's probably posed as a hypothetical. So nobody reported this. Just what, and so this is an example of you know you can't report everything. Not condoning this this conduct. Uh, but yeah, she did not report it. She thought it was confidence. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, but a couple things. The professor would probably say uh, this was a uh, advice. It was given in confidence. Uh, it was probably given hypothetically. Uh, I resolved the situation. I didn't know the specifics, and, and that's that. And I think that, that would be a fairly a powerful argument. Now, that'd be different than if we sort of change it and the professor learns more, and then it uh, sort of unfolds. You learn something in the newspaper, and things unravel. Then that might compel uh, a disclosure. But on these facts, no, she, didn't, she did not disclose. That's the little hearing. So I just want to wrap up a couple of things about this chapter. Then we'll do. Uh, we got to go through 1.6 and figure out what 1.6 is. Now, uh, you turn to page 90. Uh, yeah, I was discussing about. Uh, Attorneys, there was a big case in New York about whether an attorney could be fired at will for complying with the rules of professional responsibility. Uh, in the New York court said no. Uh, there are various jurisdictions that uh, give lawyers protection. Uh, others do not. They just say you're simply complying with the rules and then you can bring your own action for wrongful uh, termination. That's on page 90. Uh, but if we're talking about legal malpractice, I want to bring up this point. Uh, legal malpractice is something that we as attorneys do, unfortunately, and we harm uh, the client. But very hard to prove. You see it's a tort action on the top of page 91. You have a duty, you know from torts, failure of competence, that's the breach. And then there has to be a causal connection between the breach and the harm to the client. That is the but for. And that's the most difficult part because it's a case within a case. So you look at the duty, you look at the breach of that duty, but still within that case you have to prove that this breach actually caused damage. And you know, we, we as attorneys aren't guarantors of results. So those type of cases are difficult to prove. Uh, you can also have a breach of contract action. So there, there are a number of actions that are styled as legal malpractice, you have a tort action, you have a contractual action, and you have a fiduciary duty account as well because we are professionals who are held in the highest regard and we have the utmost trust placed in us by the client. Look on page 92. You may have the types of malpractice claims, they have common origins. So that, that's why I'm emphasizing these rules. Apart from you know, the examiner's class and NPRE, uh, what's probably even more important is that you avoid this type of conduct. I know you will, but so ignore conflicts of an interest. Notice that's the first one. It's very important because we've been talking about the attorney-client relationship. If you have a conflict, it totally obliterates some of these things. I should go 1.2 as well. So if you have a conflict, and this, we'll see this later. This is a sure sign of a conflict. If you can't consider all of the uh, possibilities and avenues and arguments and rationales that you would pursue for this client. You limit it by something else. Either current client, we'll see, concurrent conflict, former client, so we're looking at a current client and something that you did in the past that might impact what you're doing presently, or some type of a previous institutional affiliation. The government going, lawyer going to the private sector, the private sector lawyer going to the public sector. Uh, and so if you have a conflict, you're limited in what you can do, and your representation will be uh, less than full representation. So that's it. Uh, money again, suing the client for unpaid fee. Doing business with your client. You're going to see that's a big one, and there's even a specific rule for doing business with your client. And it's generally discouraged. You should not go into business with your client. Why? Because of all the things that we talked about in our first class. Your own personal interest, the client's interest, there may be a class of tension between those interests. And if there is, how will you as the attorney resolve that? You may slant slightly to your own personal interest and the client is at a disadvantage. So we're going to see rule 1.8, which is a specialized rule of conflicts. We're going to see in that rule that generally prohibited, but if you must enter into an agreement with a client, there are three steps that you have to take. All of them have to be in writing, fair and reasonable terms, and you even have to let the uh, client see independent counsel outside of the uh, transaction that you're trying to do with the client for a, an assessment. And you cannot press the client, say, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, I need an answer. So we'll see that as well. And then the rest of these are, are different. Settle a matter without the written authorization for your client. That's a, a scope of representation. Now, scope of representation is really important because it delineates the attorney's responsibility and the client's responsibility. We want this to be a collaborative experience as much as we can. So the client should be able to participate uh, in his or her or its own representation. So those are an example of a couple of comments. Another one that's always a killer is communication with your client. I mean, that's why we warn you all the time, particularly first year, get this in on time, communicate, follow through, proper email etiquette. Uh, many attorneys commit malpractice simply for failing to communicate with the client. Or communicating with the client so late that uh, matters fall through the cracks and it's, it's uh, bad. At the bottom of uh, 
Well, at the time of 94, you see, uh, for this year, Dewey. And this will just highlights everything I'm talking about, but keep in mind that we are in a position of utmost trust. There's a picture of uh, Will Pump on page 95. He was associate attorney general and previously a law partner of uh, Hillary Clinton in Arkansas at the Rose Law Firm. He became associate attorney general in the Clinton administration but had to resign because of activities that he did at the Rose Law Firm. You know, charging uh, things on a corporate account uh, that were personal, using uh, credit cards for that, uh, fraudulent expense reports, those type of things. So the firm sues him and then they unravel from there. Uh, and that's an example of Bible page 94, top of page 95. Uh, so this is all one type of conduct, what he did at the firm, misconduct, and criminal conduct. Now, the rest of the uh, chapter just talks about uh, uh, malpractice insurance. It's not required, but you should purchase it, or you probably be covered at whatever entity you're working in. Uh, insurance uh, has a scope of coverage. Uh, you are not covered for like intentionally defrauding or criminal acts. Uh, and malpractice insurance also impacts institutions because as a prerequisite for receiving a malpractice uh, insurance, the insurance company will want to know that there are procedures and structures in place to make sure that there's full compliance with the rules. The other book points out other areas that you have to be familiar with, this notion of other law. Like, you're going to look at uh, cases that talk about motions for disqualification. We're going to use that when we talk about conflict, so that's in interesting. And then finally on page 100, you sort of have a broad canopy of things that will uh, impact your practice. You have a state ethics code. Those are Supreme Court rules, or whatever state you're, you're going to be in. The ABA model rules, of course. We have a disciplinary law that appears throughout this book. We have ethics opinion. So if there's a whole body of law, you, you wouldn't do this, but uh, there's a whole body of law. There are these green, loose leaf books in it. There's all ethics uh, opinions from different uh, jurisdictions. And they sort of interpret the, the rule. Uh, we're going to get some things from malpractice law. Disqualification of the. That's kind of a, a law of conflicts. We'll see that. Criminal law. Court rules. Regulatory <coughs> So this is just an example of, of that other law that we're talking about. So, thus far, we have talked about the structure that regulates us, and now we're going to start talking about different components of the attorney-client relationship that have to be preserved, and then the next series of chapters, by the time we get to chapter six, we'll be talking about conflicts, things that can undermine the attorney-client relationship. Now, someone look at rule 1.6, tell me what it says. It's good to sort of unpack the rule before we get into uh, this discussion. And you start out with this basic rule, you see on the bottom of page 101. We're obliged to keep our clients' secrets. In fact, lawyers are required to keep confidential much of what they learn in representing clients. So this is really broad. This is not uh, something that uh, impacts us because we're involved in a particular proceeding or before court or an administrative agency. We have this broad rule to protect confidences. Not just what we learn from the attorney, I'm sorry, from the client, but from other sources as well. So this is a clear bright line rule that we have to keep these confidences. So how do we break down this rule? What does it mean? Confidentiality of information. All right. Question. Like everything, we have this mandatory black law edict. But then it says, except. We have exception. And that's letter B, but I'm focusing on letter A now. What does letter A tell you? Read? You want to read it? Yeah, well, I want you to interpret it. Read it and interpret it. Tell us what it means. <coughs> so you can't, you can't tell anyone, reveal any information relating to representation of your client unless your client gives you the consent to do so. Okay, that's good. That's good. Notice how broad, I mean, what, what do you think relating to means? That's interesting. Because notice, uh, you know, you talk about attorney-client privilege, we talked about it a little bit in this class, you talked about it in civil procedure. Attorney-client privilege is sort of driven by the context and the interaction and what the representation is. Uh, this seems a little bit broader to me. What do you think relating to me? Relating to the case? Or the actual person's identity? Yeah, both. A lot of things. And so it's telling us it doesn't have to come directly from the client. It can come from us learning about things as we represent the client. So lawyers shall not reveal information. That's, shall not is mandatory. A lawyer shall not reveal information <coughs> Relating to, that's broad. The representation of a client. So this is mandatory. And there's an exception built into uh, 1.6a, unless the client gives informed consent. So you go to the client, I know this, we need to uh, move this along, I may need to reveal this, is it okay with you? Yeah. Now, it wouldn't be that quick. Informed consent means that the client fully understands what you're intending to do, how you're going to execute it, and the consequences of disclosure. So informed consent is, is important. It, it's not just a, yeah, I'll talk to you about it. The client will be fully versed in the action and uh, what the consequences of that action are. So the client can give informed consent. I'll just, I'm paraphrasing. The client can give informed consent. <coughs> well, that's, that's, so that's kind of an acceptable kind of rule. It sort of goes beyond shall not. Generally, you shall not reveal anything. You can't reveal if the client gives informed consent or 
Uh, you can't reveal. Can't disclose. Yeah. Disclosure is impliedly authorized. Carry out the representation. So this is an example of what this board is talking about. We should say reach out to an attorney. Maybe you have a conflict of interest question. That conflict of interest impacts upon some confidential information that you have. You want to make sure you resolve that conflict correctly. So you reach out to a law professor or someone on the ethics committee. Uh, but before you do that, you talk to the client. You need to reveal this. I'm going to reveal it in a hypothetical situation in a way that doesn't come back to you or identify you. But I need to handle this information in this particular way so that I can get a clear view about conflicts, how it might impact the representation moving forward. You can do that. That would be impliedly authorized. Or there's a situation where you don't even have to do that. Uh, you have to reveal in order to move something forward. So uh, the client's uh, address and phone number, and you're using that to fill out an application that the client has told you to fill out for him or her. That's impliedly authorized. So anything that would help the, the representation, and where you would not necessarily have to get the permission of the client to disclose. But generally, this is mandatory. We do not want to disclose. So look at comment two. It sort of spells out what we're doing. So this is underscoring what I've been saying all along. This is a fundamental bedrock of the attorney-client relationship. There will be no relationship without trust. And the way, one way that you build and maintain and preserve trust is if the client thinks that she can divulge anything to you. The lawyer must not reveal information relating to the representation. This contributes to the trust that is the hallmark of the client-lawyer relationship. Now notice this. Comment 3 makes a clear distinction between information that you protect within the context of proceedings or some type of structural framework and this broad requirement that we protect confidence. So notice this. The, this is in the middle of comment 3. The rule of client-lawyer confidentiality implies a situation other than those where evidence is sought from the lawyer through compulsion of law. So you know, this is apart from just litigation where you say, no, attorney-client privilege, those were uh, discussions that we had in, in anticipation of litigation that's protected, uh, protected under work product and all that. All of that is responding to uh, some type of motion or some type of requirement within a process that would compel you to reply. Yes, confidence is covered that, but this is even broader. It relates other, to, other than that. It applies not only to matters communicating the confidence of the client, but also information relating to the information, relating to the representation, whatever its source. So beyond what we simply gain from the client, we can gain from other sources as well. So we have that. We shall not reveal. The client can't give informed consent. It can be impliedly authorized uh, to carry out the representation. And then the final one, or disclosure, is permitted under almost Now these are exceptions to the general prohibition not to disclose. But notice the oper op operative word here, may. Permissive. So all of these are going to tell us we can, but we do not have to. So you look on page 102 and 103, that's what I just said. But look at that uh, the box on the top of page 103. So that's generally known information, personal information. And they're trying to, they're trying to illustrate, illustrate what relating to the representation means. Broad concept. Now what about 1.6b? Which tells us, even though we shall not reveal confidences, there are some situations where we may exercise our discretion and make the choice to disclose. So it's us determining what we will disclose. So someone take you through these exceptions. What, what are we getting? So we have a lot of them. We have uh, seven. We have one, two, So we generally shall not disclose. There are some scenarios in that shall not where we can disclose. It's part of the representation. The client can give informed consent. And now we're under here, permissive. Or disclosure is permitted under 1.6b. So tell me about these exceptions and what do you think the rationale is? What about 1.6b1? And then I want to know, is the example in uh, comment 1 to 1.6b1 a good example? So 1.6b1 says a lawyer may reveal, may reveal information relating to the representation of a client to the extent the lawyer reasonably believes necessary. And the first is to prevent certain death or substantial bodily harm. Certain death or substantial bodily harm. Is that? How do you know that? Yeah. Okay, that's true. So what about this example that they give in the comment? Look at uh, comment 6. I'll just put C comment 6. So you, you, uh, you represent an industrial company and they're dumping water in the Ohio River that is, or chemicals in the Ohio River. That's the example. So we're trying to protect the <coughs> overriding value of life and physical integrity, and that would permit disclosure. Reasonably necessary to prevent certain death 
a substantial bodily harm. So and then it tries to answer what Ms. Harper was saying, well, how do you know? The attorney has to make this judgment that it is reasonably certain. And the way to do that, the comment says, uh, such harm is reasonably certain to occur if it will be suffered imminently, or if there's a present and substantial threat that a person will suffer such harm. So the example that they give is, you have a client, you know that client is accidentally discharging toxic waste into the Ohio River. And the comment resolved it by saying that the attorney may reveal this information if there's a present and substantial risk that a person who drinks the water will contract a life-threatening or be able to debilitating disease. And that disclosure is necessary to remove that threat. That might be a more powerful argument today, getting light of Flint and uh, other places, upstate like New York. So, but all that just goes to show this. It's not sort of a clear-cut rule. You're going to have to exercise your judgment in order to figure out whether or not disclosure is permitted. Now, notice again, it's permissive. You could decide, yeah, I've looked at all this. It's not reasonably certain to me. I'm not going to disclose. Now, number two and three are important because they are, in varying degrees, instances where the lawyer's services have been used in a way that is impermissible. So you look at 1.6b2. You're trying to prevent the client from committing crime or fraud, reasonably certain to result in substantial injury to financial interests. And notice, the lawyer's services have been used in furtherance of that harm. So 1.6b2, you're trying to prevent. 1.6b3, the lawyer's services are still used in furtherance. But here it's already occurred. Mitigate or rectify. And if you look at the comments to it, comment seven. So the thing that B2 and B3 have in common is that the lawyer's services were used in furtherance of something. And if you look at the comments, comment seven talks about preventing the client from committing a fraud. So these two rules are really saying the client can do something so serious and impactful to third parties outside of the attorney-client relationship that it is appropriate for the attorney to make the decision to disclose. That's what comment seven. <coughs> now, one thing that we're hoping under 1.6b2 <coughs> is that if you, and you're certainly gonna talk to the client before you disclose because you want to persuade the client, maybe you shouldn't do this. And that's the best outcome that you say to your client, I have a duty not to have my services used in this way. You should refrain from this conduct. If you don't, then I will tell. The client can, of course, prevent such disclosure by refraining from the wrongful conduct. So, now notice this, although this rule does not require the lawyer to reveal the client's misconduct, so you don't have to reveal, it's up to you. The lawyer may not counsel or assist the client to conduct what the lawyer knows is criminal or fraudulent conduct. So that's just another way of saying that the discussion that we had about 1.2, which talked about the lawyer assisting criminal fraud or other conduct that violates the rules, that's still in play. You cannot have your services used in that way. And as I said, 1.6b3, the fraud has already occurred, and then the lawyer is coming back around to try and mitigate that. 1.6b4, is I'll just put compliance. So this is a, an example where disclosure may be permitted, but what you're trying to do is comply with the rules of, of professional responsibility. Five is there is a, you're trying to establish a claim or defense. The only way the lawyer can really defend himself or herself is to, is to disclose. So now notice this, when you have a, I wanna put some limits on this notion of may disclose. So when you disclose, and you'll see this in the comments, uh, you disclose only to the extent that it's necessary to resolve the issue. So if there's a dispute between you and your client, or you're trying to establish a claim or defense, you don't say I'm gonna tell everything that's confidential. You disclose what is necessary. If you look at uh, comment 10, it says this, the lawyer may respond to the extent the lawyer reasonably believes necessary to establish a defense. So that would mean you're not getting everything that's confidential to establish a defense. You're using what's necessary to establish the defense. And then finally, 1.6b6, to comply with other law or court order, Now this may cause you to fight a little bit, particularly if the court is ordering you to divulge something that's confidential and the client does not want that to be divulged. You should at least uh, protest that disclosure. And, and again, uh, it says may, so then you're gonna make the decision uh, whether or not uh, to disclose. Now, this is interesting because the comments really don't give us uh, any guidance. Comment 12 is interesting in this regard. And it says something like this, it really doesn't resolve it. It says something like this. Uh, other law may require that a lawyer disclose information about a client. Whether such other law subsidies 1.6 is a question of law beyond the scope of these rules. So we're gonna see that, like uh, in the case about the uh, hidden bodies and the serial killer. And then the state says, okay, you have this, uh, this confidentiality requirement. We have a state public health law that tells us that you have to disclose uh, the uh, whereabouts of uh, human remains for health and other reasons. Then the question is, does that supersede 1.6? Comment 12 really doesn't give us an answer to that. It just says, when disclosure of information relating to the information appears to be required by other law, the lawyer simply has to discuss that with the client. And we already know that under 1.4, you have to communicate with the client, but it doesn't resolve the issue. So there could be a situation where you have to comply with other law or court order, but then there's another level of analysis where you have to look at whether or not that law actually supersedes 1.6. Comment 12 doesn't give you any guidance. It just says it's beyond the scope of that rule. So if you were in that situation in jurisdiction, you have to do some research to sort of compare 
of that law and its requirements in the requirements of 1.6. Okay, so that's 1.6, generally. And now you sort of have the soft problem on page 105, general with animals. <coughs> now, how do you think this works? Now, this, the reason that this is in the book is sort of to show you uh, you could be having a casual conversation, but you're also concerned about whether or not you're divulging information. But we want to be clear that we are trying to uh, protect confidence. We have to be actively engaged in making sure that there are no inadvertent uh, disclosures. So what about this problem on page 105? So a lawyer social worker, they were friends in law school and they're having this conversation. Someone on, it starts really on page 106 and 107. What about this conversation? Do you think that they're talking about things that they shouldn't be talking about? Do they go too far in this discussion? What about? Yeah, yeah, I think she went too far by saying his first name. So, so take us through the conversation, what they say, and then talk about what things that they said that was probably should not have been disclosed. So Anna's friend, they were just basically talking about how work was and, and their work day. Anna's friend was a social worker. She was telling her about um, her days with children, with terminal illnesses, and, and all of that. And uh, so I don't think she should have said that really either. She was saying names, I think, and, and diseases and all that. But um, so Anna's the lawyer here. See, that, that's a, yeah, that's true. Uh, they throw, sort of throw that in there because she's a social worker. So her, her thing is another one point six, but she probably has some ethical duties. And I think uh, the way the problem is constructed, uh, we can say, well, she's general enough, so it's not a bad thing. What about the lawyer? Bro? So when we go through it, yeah. um, uh, so she's saying she's working against, about this case against the police. She was kind of general right there. Okay, that's good. And then said police, police brutality. brutality. Yeah. So that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but then our client is this guy named Joey. So I think just saying the first name, we need to say that it was a guy, I don't know. Um, you probably can't look up any Joey's, but you know. Right, look, and so look, she even says, uh, I better not say his last name. Yeah. Not that I would, it would mean anything to you, but, but you know it's confidential. So in all likelihood, even if we said the last name, maybe the uh, the attorney wouldn't know, uh, the, the, uh, anyone wouldn't know, uh, but want to make sure. So that's why she says that, okay. Next one, she gives a location. She said a bar downtown called the Alley, of where okay. you know the event happened or whatever. Right. Um, he had quite a lot to drink. There's a fight between some other guys in the bar, and Joey got arrested. So she said, "Well, he wasn't involved in the fight." And so now she's asking questions. The friends asking questions to try and figure out the story. And I don't know. It's just, it seems too deep to yeah, me. Yeah, that's that. Well, I think what you're reacting to is on some levels uh, kind of discrediting her own client uh, in a public. Uh, well, Joey says he wasn't fighting, but my boss Arthur thinks he may have been an instigator. Wow. So that's that's confidential information that could be damaging. Even though we don't know the last name, we know uh, the bar where it occurred, general time frame. So, so that could be a problem. And we have the police officer's name in the next sentence. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so then, yeah, Mallory, they came, the police came, uh, broke Joey's arm. Joey says, uh, yeah, Joey, she tells the police officer's name. Then the woman asks more questions. Um, are there criminal charges? Joey, and then says Joey was charged with assault and was resisting arrest, uh, but the charges were thrown out when Mallory didn't show up in the court. So she's just going through, I mean, telling everything pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what she didn't tell, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Well, so it's set up that way. So I think, and the reason the problem is set up this way is to show you how things can quickly unravel. And you may think you're talking innocuously, uh, but there are things that lead to finding other information that could be confidential. So you have to guard against that as an attorney. Not only the, the literal things that are confidential, the client told me this and that's that, but things that you find out in an investigation and other conversations as well. So I think it would be fine uh, if she merely said this is a police brutality uh, case. That's not going to reveal anything that could be traced to the uh, case of the client. And simply stating that the client wants to sue the police, that doesn't reveal nothing. There are lots of police brutality uh, suits. Uh, but then, uh, as we just pointed out, the more information you give, uh, the worse it gets. So after the point of the police brutality case, you have all of the details of this factual situation. Breaking the wrist, <coughs> when it occurred, uh, the, the bar, the location, name of the bar, the name of the police officer. I think that uh, is what starts the ball rolling, uh, as well as sort of discrediting the theory of the case. So on some level, certainly she says uh, too much. Uh, so even if you take this notion that uh, we have to protect this information up front. There is also, if you look at Rule 1.6, there's a comment, and it is comment four. So th this is what this, this uh, our little factual situation goes with. Comment four says this, and this is how broad confidences are. Uh, this prohibition also applies to disclosure by a lawyer that do not in themselves reveal protected information, but could reasonably lead to the discovery of such information by a third person. So that's why we're so sensitive about these factual situations. So uh, Joey wants to file suit against the police. That's, that's fine, but then when we talk about the police officer's name, the location, theory of the case, that could inadvertently lead to confidential information. Even though taken together, uh, it's not protected. We know a bar is a public location, we know where that bar is, but when we connect it to our client, that may be what causes under comment four us to reveal information that could reasonably lead to discovery of protected information. Uh, and that's what we want to try to avoid. So, that also points out, we can't, as lawyers, we have lives too, so every time we go to a bar or restaurant, we just can't, no, I'm not gonna talk about this, uh, you, you sort of have to uh, exercise uh, judgment uh, and resolve marginal cases where you think it might lead towards something. Resolve those cases in favor of non-disclosure, because that's really what 1.6 does. Also, look at page 114 and then comment 18 as well. Uh, you, you have even greater challenges. So it's not just a paper and pencil world, it's a world where you're active on various social platforms. Uh, so be careful that uh, those social interactions don't integrate with your representation of, a, of an attorney, uh, of a client, I'm sorry. That's what I'm talking about on page 114. And comment 18 says uh, <coughs> that we are required to act competently and safeguard information relating to the representation, again, very broad confidentiality, against un unauthorized access by third party. Uh, and so that means uh, electronically as well. And comment 18 is really long, but it talks about all of the uh, reasonable efforts that protect client confidences, I'll just put individual A. 
So a variety of contexts we have to be aware of. Now, you see on page 116 and 117, we went through that chart, I sort of went point by point, but that chart on 116 and 117 illustrates how we took apart the, uh, the rule. So let's start this first problem on page 120, the missing person. So this is where we have that tension. We've gone through 1.6 and, and we say generally we should not disclose. So that ultimately means that we are going to have information uh, that someone outside of the attorney-client relationship may want. And there will be legitimate reasons for that outside party wanting that information. You know, this societal notion of closure, uh, empathy, justice, what the public thinks is justice. But we have this duty to preserve confidence. So you see on page 119, oftentimes, and if you're doing criminal defense work, this is what will happen. You will have a client coming to you for advice. And in order to be able to give that advice effectively, the client must be assured that you will not turn on him or her. So the lawyer needs to be able to talk to the client, and the client needs to be able to talk to the lawyer in confidence. <coughs> so notice this. The crime is past conduct. There's nothing we can do to stop or prevent it. We have someone coming to us for help. <coughs> And then you have these societal interests, like we talked about in our first class that will be present upon you. There's this societal notion of justice. Uh, the parents of these children should uh, be able to know that uh, for religious and social reasons that these bodies can be located uh, and the family can heal and move on. So, you see on page 119, we have to protect this information as confidential, particularly if it's past criminal activity by crime. This analysis has led to a broad consensus in the legal community that lawyers should protect this confidential, most information about past criminal activity by crime. So, that, so that's the setup for this problem on page 120. And this actually occurred in New York, upper New York State. So what about this case? <coughs> so the problem is set up this way. We have humanitarian impulses. We want to, you know, doing the right thing would be to give the parents this information, I guess. But we have our professional duties of protection of the client. I mean, the client isn't a great person or anything. We're not making that type of value judgment. We're saying that as attorneys bound by our rules that we have, professional responsibility, 1.6, we can't devolve. So you have this scenario, uh, a mass murderer, he starts with the murder of Philip Dombuski, who he's eventually convicted uh, of murdering, uh, as well as other uh, college students, and you see that on page 120. Uh, and so we have this attorney who has never represented a defendant in a murder case, but he's appointed by the court. Uh, you see the top of page 121. Uh, the lawyer is asked by the judge to represent Garrow. You see a picture of him, Robert Garrow, here. Uh, and he's hesitant, wasn't sure he could handle the case. Uh, these allegations are really uncomfortable because they all live in the same town. One of the teenagers is a friend uh, of, of one of his daughters, uh, but he's on the case, he has reservations. So he partners up with another attorney and they go about representing Garrow. Uh, on page 122, there's this discussion about uh, hypnotically enhanced and refreshed uh, memory of their client. But ultimately, Garrow uh, confesses to killing uh, all of these young adults uh, and really heinous crimes. You see on page 123. Uh, so what do we do? Because you're dumbfounded by these confessions. You pour yourself together and ask Garrow for exact information about the location of the bodies. As you get this information, you tell him you will get back to him in a few days. The client has not given us as attorneys any permission to share any of this information with the prosecutor, and we reassure him that we're not going to say anything. We, we can't because of confidentiality. I'm not sure if our client is telling the truth. It is possible that he could be making this up, it says, to seem insane, to get the prosecutor's interest, just waste our time, we don't know. Uh, what do we do? And you have three options. Starting on page 123 to 124, we have three options. One is reveal, how we know crime has been convict, committed, tell the prosecutor and authorities, and reveal. You know, that causes us to go outside of this rule. And if we are going to reveal, we're going to have to place it into one of these exceptions. May. May we reveal. So it tells us generally we shall not reveal. But one option is to reveal. The other is uh, go out there and visit the site to substantiate what our client has told us. So we need to go out there and look around and see what's happening. I don't know about that. Or do nothing. 1.6 means what it means. That means we keep our mouth shut and we, and we represent our client. Then it says maybe we can reveal under 1.6b1. Do we have an argument that would allow us to reveal? Probably would be the best argument to use. No? Tell me. And no real indication that it's ongoing or anything. You look at comment six, it talks about some type of imminence. You're right, and so probably not. So what would you do? Sorry. Or maybe, oh, uh, before we, what about 1.6? B6. Probably tell us something like that. Uh, <coughs> so I need to comply with all the law. That means I may divulge this confidential information because it says, does that prevent disclosure of the location of the bodies because such disclosure is necessary to comply with other law? The other laws are still held by requiring reporting the discovery of bodies so that they can be given a proper burial. What about that? And so that's a preview of what actually happened in the case. You'll see that around page 128. Go ahead. I have a question. Uh, was that public level? It says reporting the discovery of bodies. So would that require the attorney general to make sure they're nervous? Or is that just because he didn't know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think 
I wouldn't go out there, first of all. I'm like, but but if, if I made a judgment by, uh, that my client was telling the truth, then I would have to say, well, am I compelled by this health law to do it? You'll see later on that the, the court said, no, this health law doesn't trump uh, 1.6. But you know, that was the context of, the, of what was happening in that community. The community was so outraged at these attorneys that there was a public outcry. We have to get them on something, and we're going to do the public health law. That's why the prosecutor uh, brought that. And so they, they lost the second time uh, when they turned around and said, uh, it's to comply with public health law. And you know, comment 12, as I said before, really doesn't give us that much. It says it's beyond the scope of the rule. But I think if 1.6 means something, it must mean uh, that you hold on to that confidence uh, in, the, in, in the face of that health law. Uh, so what would we do? At this point, do nothing to keep representing. I can't so you can you you have three options. You can alert the police, the prosecutor, and the press. The parents will have closure about their children. We will uh, give the public confidence. Uh, maybe not even don't tell the uh, client. Just do this like as an anonymous tip type thing. So we maintain loyalty and confidentiality in quotation marks. So disclose. Uh, do a side investigation. We want to make sure that the bodies are really really there. Uh, maybe that will bolster the insanity defense and provide a bargaining tool uh, with the prosecution. But the risks there are heavy for the attorney. Uh, tampering with evidence. Uh, leading the prosecution of evidence before you can use it, number thing. Or defend your client. Helping the police to convict a girl uh, cannot possibly be your best role as an advocate. Uh, and so, if your role as an advocate means anything, you keep this confidence and you represent the class. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was going to suggest, um, kind of like you mentioned, where maybe you could use that information to motivate prosecution to end this plea deal or uh, something in that way. And, you know, just saying my client would be motivated to give you more information if you're motivated to uh, enter into some kind of agreement. Um, and that's not sure that's saying that you have information, just that there may be some motivation there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Now, so notice, that, and that's kind of what happened in real life, this thing, because this community, I'll tell you, is just outraged that the public really doesn't understand our, our, how can you keep this a secret when you know what happened and justice uh, won't be done unless you reveal it. See, that's the posture. And so you're using these formalistic uh, lawyer rules to prevent people from having closure, uh, and you're uh, obstructing justice on, on some literal level. Uh, and so you look on page 125. So as trial was approaching, and so the, to resolve this, the, the best option, and the one that was chosen in the real case, is really option three, that when one of the victim's fathers come to the office, ask us about it, we don't give the information, we go to the prosecutor, <coughs> and offer to get a prosecution information that will help solve the two missing cases in exchange for a plea bargain, acceptance of our client's insanity defense. So the prosecutors proposed this bargain on bottom of page 125, and the prosecutor is enraged. You knew about this, you're obstructing justice, <coughs> the community is furious at these lawyers for fulfilling their eth ethical duty, and then you have the actual case. So you had the prosecutor actually charging uh, the attorney with a public health violation. So notice the prosecutor didn't charge him with obstruction of justice, but the only thing he really had was uh, public health violation. That indictment was dismissed. Look at the, uh, this is the uh, New York Supreme Court, that's the trial court uh, for Onondaga County. Uh, the attorney was acquitted because the duty to protect privileged information trumped the duty to report. And so if the defendant has a Fifth Amendment privilege not to incriminate himself, the attorney can't sort of go along and help and undermine uh, that constitutional right. You see the bottom of page uh, 127, note 36? That makes the distinction that I was making between confidence and privileges. Confidence is much broader, it relates to the representation. Privileges are the rules of a certain procedure or, or trial or litigation context. So after the court dismissed the indictment, they appealed to the appellate division, which is the next uh, level of court, and then the highest level of court in New York is the New York Court of Appeal. But the appellate division uh, affirmed the trial court's dismissal of the indictment. Now notice this, this is interesting. Uh, the court really doesn't address the ethical issue, which is interesting to me. It says, uh, what we want to look at primarily is whether or not there was a, uh, does, does uh, the attorney's non-disclosure of information, does it fly in light of this public health law? And the court says, we believe that attorney-client privilege effectively shielded the defendant attorney from his actions, which would otherwise have violated the public health law. So this is really a sufficiency of evidence case. Did the attorney violate the public health law? No, we affirm the trial court because the trial court says this indictment is dismissed because the duty to preserve these confidences trumps the duty to report. The court does not reach uh, the ethical considerations. Notice at the top of page 129, we write to emphasize our serious uh, concern regarding the consequences which might emanate from the claim of absolute attorney-client privilege. So it's no secret that this court is sort of in the community as well in this hearing. Well, you're allowing attorneys to not disclose this information and it's having consequences. Uh, so the only question that was uh, presented, as I said before, was the adequacy or sufficiency of these indictments. The court concludes that, but doesn't really deal with the ethical issue about how do we balance 1.6, mandatory duty not to disclose, uh, and these permissive exceptions, one of which is compliance with other law. Other law wasn't strong enough here to uh, mandate disclosure, but what type of situation would? The court doesn't really answer that. Okay, we'll pick up there and we'll come back and we'll just finish the chapter. Uh, yeah. Chapter three.